Welcome to another of my Standing on the Shoulder of Giants programs, and this week we'll be looking at galaxies. Galaxies are huge gravitationally bound systems of stars, gas, dust and dark matter. The smallest galaxies contain a few hundred million stars, while the largest can have up to a hundred trillion. Modern estimates believe that the observable universe contains more than two trillion galaxies. Yes, that's two trillion with a T. Some galaxies appear as irregular clusters of stars and gas. Others look like large compact ellipses. Still, when most people picture a galaxy, they picture a dramatic spiral shape with curved arms dotted with bright clusters of stars and filaments of dust. Today, entire fields of astronomy are devoted to studying the formation, evolution, chemistry and the physics of galaxies. Back in the 1920s, astronomers' explanation for the strange distant spiral structures we saw in the sky was very different. Referred to as spiral nebulae, they weren't sure whether they were strangely shaped nebula in our own Milky Way galaxy or mysterious distant objects referred to as island universes. The question was the subject of a fierce debate at the time. It was ultimately settled thanks to the amazing discoveries of Henrietta Swan Leavitt, one of the Harvard computers, and observations carried out by the most famous names of all in astronomy, Edwin Hubble. To understand how we know about galaxies, we need to go back to the Harvard computers and what they taught us about stars. In 1895, Henrietta Swan Leavitt began working as a Harvard computer. She had been born in Massachusetts and attended Oberlin and Harvard colleges, developing a focus in astronomy during her studies. Along with Annie Jump Cannon, she was one of the earliest Harvard computers, and also, like Cannon, she lost her hearing in her twenties due to an illness. As a computer, Levitt was assigned to work on astronomical images taken at the Harvard Observatory in Peru, and focused on the large and small Magellanic Clouds. Indigenous astronomers in South America Africa and Western Asia knew the Magellanic Clouds well. Two large blurs in the southern sky that appear as faint clouds. European voyagers recorded these strange clouds in the 16th century and their popular name was eventually associated with explorer Ferdinand Magellan. By the mid-1800s astronomers speculated that these clouds actually contained more than a thousand stars nebulae and stellar clusters, and that these stars seem to be much further away than the nearby stars of the Milky Way. By the time Henrietta Leavitt was tasked with studying variable stars in the Magellanic Clouds, their nature as large clusters of stars was well known, though exactly how far away the clouds were remained a mystery. Levitt proved to be a prolific discoverer of variable stars, stars whose apparent brightness fluctuates. In 1905 alone she catalogued 900 new variable stars in the small Magellanic Cloud. In addition to discovering new variables, Levitt was also hard at work quantifying each star's brightness and tracking how it changed with time. During this work she noticed something surprising. A number of these variables stars belong to a class known as Cepheid variables, originally discovered in the late 1700s. First, in 1784, Edward Pigott detected the variable star of Eta Aquilia. A few months later, John Goodridge discovered the classical Cepheid Delta Salphi. Cepheids displayed a distinctive variation in their brightness as a function of time, commonly referred to as a star's light curve. Looking at a Cepheid light curve we can see its distinct shape. A Cepheid rapidly increases in brightness as a function of time before briefly reaching a peak and then beginning a longer and slower decrease. Once the star reaches a characteristic minimum brightness the variation repeats again 
make insipids periodic variables that repeat their telltale brightening and dimming episodes with perfect regularity over time. As Levitt discovered more and more cepid variables in the small Magellanic cloud, she noticed that the brightness of the cepheids seemed to have the longest variation periods. Like her fellow astronomers of the day, Levitt assumed that all the stars inside the Magellanic clouds shared a common distance from Earth. This assumption turned out to be correct, although an actual estimate of the cloud's distance wouldn't come in till much later. Because of this, the apparent brightness of these stars can be directly connected to the intrinsic brightness of the stars. In short, within one of the clouds, one star wouldn't look dimmer than another simply because it's further away. It would look dimmer because the star is truly emitting less light. The amount of light that a star emits is commonly referred to as its luminosity and represents how much energy the star is emitting from its surface. Eventually, other astronomers were able to measure the distance to the Magellanic clouds using parallax, a word derived from Greek meaning alternation. Parallax is a simple technique and one that you can easily test out at home. If you close one eye and then the other, you'll notice that nearby objects appear to shift back and forth a great deal depending on which eye you use, while more distant objects appear to move far less. By taking high precision observations at different points in the Earth's orbit around the Sun and using basic principles of geometry, astronomers could use this same technique to measure the distance to nearby stars depending on how much they appear to move. They determined that the small Magellanic cloud was about 200,000 light years away. Today we know that the large and small Magellanic clouds are actually small irregular galaxies, satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way, but at the time astronomers believed that both clouds were simply large distant clusters of stars in our own galaxy. With this new distant measurement based on parallax, Levitt was able to calculate the relationship between a Cepheid's variables period and its true luminosity. Her discovery was published in a 1912 paper. In it, Levitt noted the f key fact that there was a simple relation between the luminosity of the Cepheid variables and their periods. This relationship, which came to be known as the period-luminosity relationship, or Levitt's law, was quite exciting at the time, but the true impact of this discovery had galaxy-shaking implications. Henrietta Levitt had discovered the first example of something called a standard candle. Imagine standing with a friend who is holding a flashlight on a dark night at one end of a long quiet street. Standing close to the flashlight, it will appear incredibly bright. However, as you walk away from your friend, the flashlight will appear to get dimmer and dimmer. By the time you've reached the other end of the street, you may barely be able to see it at all. This experiment demonstrates a fundamental property of light known as the inverse square law, which states that as you move away from the light source, its apparent intensity, how bright it looks, will decrease in proportion to the square of the distance. In other words, if your distance from the flashlight doubles, its apparent brightness will decrease by a factor of 4. If your distance triples, the brightness will decrease by a factor of 9. Now, imagine that you know the flashlight has a 20 watt bulb. If you walk away from the flashlight and use a scientific instrument that can measure how bright the bulb is, you could use that apparent brightness, your knowledge of the bulb's wattage, and the inverse square law to calculate how far you've walked away. In astronomy, a light source like this, with a known luminosity, is also known as a standard candle. If we have a way of determining the actual luminosity we expect from the object, we can compare that to the apparent brightness that we see and measure its distance. 
This technique is particularly valuable when studying very distant objects. Eventually the effects of parallax stop working because things get too far away. If you try the left eye and the right eye trick with a distant building or tree on the horizon, odds are you won't see it move at all. However, since a standard candle depends on the inverse square law, it can reach much further as a result. As long as we have instruments that can detect a standard candle and measure its brightness, it can be used to measure a distance. For bright stars like Cepheids, the Levitt law meant that we could measure the Cepheids variation period. We could infer its true luminosity. We could then compare that to its apparent brightness and use the inverse square law to calculate how far it is away giving us unprecedented reach when it comes to measuring the distance of stars. You might be wondering why a Cepheid works this way. Why would a star seem to get brighter and dimmer over time? Why would this happen so regularly? And why should this be connected to the star's luminosity? We know today that Cepheids appear to vary because they are pulsating, growing and shrinking radially and appearing to get brighter and dimmer as a result. The Cepheids that Henrietta Leavitt discovered were born with 4 to 20 times as much mass as our Sun. Temperature-wise they were surprisingly similar to our Sun, around 5000 to 8000 degrees Kelvin, which is 8500 to 14000 degrees Fahrenheit at their surfaces. Any jump cannon would have classified them as F, G or K type stars and our own Sun is a type G2. These temperatures give rise to the specific conditions that make these stars pulsate. The physics of a Cepheid's pulsation is similar to the physics involved in a two-stroke combustion engine. Combustion engines generate power by the motions of pistons set in cylinders. For an engine to work properly, it needs to inject heat into the cylinder at exactly the right moment, when the fuel above the piston is compressed. In a gasoline engine, this is accomplished by producing a spark during compression. This spark ignites the fuel, which expands and pushes the piston downward, turning the crankshaft. In a two-stroke engine, as exhaust gases escape through an outlet pipe, fuel enters the cylinder and the piston rises ready to begin another cycle of compression. The key here is producing the spark at the moment of maximum compression of fuel, creating the explosion that would drive the piston downwards to power the crankshaft. The same basic principle applies in the outer layers of a Cepheid variable. As the outer layers of the star shrink and become compressed, the density of the gas increases. At the temperatures of a Cepheid variable, more atoms in the gas will become ionized, ejecting electrons and making the gas more opaque to the radiation trying to pass through it. Unable to pass cleanly through the gas, the radiation is trapped and the energy of the layer rises. This increases the energy at a moment of maximum compression, just like in our internal combustion two-stroke engine. The trapped energy then drives the star's outer layers to expand again. When the gas expands, the density decreases and the atoms in the gas recombine, reuniting with their electrons and decreasing the opacity of the gas. With radiation now able to pass through the gas, the formerly trapped energy escapes, releasing excess heat so that the layers can settle and begin a new compression phase. If the outer layers of the star are too cold, this mechanism won't work. The layer where the gas is ionized will be too low and won't be able to lift the layers above it. This mechanism also won't work when the star is too hot. There, the layer that gas is ionized is too close to the surface of the star and there won't be enough gas above it to produce an apparent pulsation. As a result, 
This type of pulsating behaviour is restricted to that 5000 to 8000 Kelvin temperature range, typical of Cepheids. If we look at Cepheids and other rare types of stars that pulsate like this on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, plotting surface temperature against luminosity, it's clear that they all fall along what we call the instability strip. Henrietta Leavitt's discovery revealed that more luminous Cepheids, outputting more energy at their surface, take longer to complete a pulsation cycle. Today, Cepheids are just one of several standard candles that astronomers use. We'll come back to standard candles at a later date, but all share a common thread of making remarkable distant estimates possible and changing what we know about the very structure of our universe. Henrietta Leavitt's discovery of the period luminosity relationship for Cepheids was no exception. Remember our mysterious spiral nebulae? In the early 1900s a fierce debate was churning in the astronomical community about what spiral nebulae actually were. The argument came to a head in April 1920 with an event known as the Great Debate, a presentation pitting astronomers Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis against one another at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Harlow Shapley was convinced that these spiral nebulae were part of the Milky Way and pointed to the nearby Great Andromeda Nebula as evidence. If this nebula were a separate galaxy, he argued, it would imply that it sat more than a hundred million light years from our own, a distance far beyond anything imagined by astronomers at that point in time. He also mentioned that observers had detected a surprisingly bright burst of light in the Andromeda galaxy in 1885. At the time, a flash like this was known as a nova, a term we now used to refer to an eruption from the surface of a nearby star. Astronomers were detecting novae fairly regularly at the time, but this particular nova had been shockingly bright, appearing to briefly outshine the entirety of the Andromeda Nebula. Shapley correctly pointed out that if this particular nova had truly been hundreds of millions of light years away, it implied a brightness and energy release so extreme it seemed impossible. Other astronomers supported Shapley's view. They thought that the spiral shapes of these nebulae might be a sign of new solar systems being formed elsewhere in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, Heber Curtis argued that Andromeda and the other strange spiral nebula were in fact other galaxies or island universes. He acknowledged that Andromeda had hosted a very large nova. In fact, it had hosted quite a number of nova, most much dimmer, and all concentrated in the great Andromeda nebula. Based on this, he argued that Andromeda must comprise in its own collection of stars, with its own age and its own rate of nova events. Otherwise, why would so many novae be concentrated in such a small part of the Milky Way? Curtis also pointed to the dark shapes tracing the spiral arms or other nebulae, noting that they looked similar to the dust clouds found in the Milky Way. The debate itself didn't do much to settle the argument. It became clear that there was only one way to truly settle the argument. Astronomers needed a way to measure the distance to the Great Andromeda Nebula, Early efforts to measure its distance had not yielded any useful result. A year before the Great Debate, a young astronomer named Edwin Hubble accepted a staff position at Mount Wilson. Despite a childhood interest in astronomy and an undergraduate degree in astronomy and mathematics from the University of Chicago, Hubble studied to be a lawyer at Oxford following his father's wishes. However, he changed his focus back to astronomy when he entered graduate school at Chicago. His thesis research was carried out at George Hale's Yerkes Observatory and focused on studying photographic plates of faint nebula. 
Hubble arrived at Mount Wilson after World War I, just as Hale's infamous 100-inch telescope was being completed, and Hubble quickly began to use the 100-inch for his, te his research. On an October night in 1923, Hubble captured a photographic plate image of the Great Andromeda Nebula that revealed a shocking discovery, a Cepheid variable in Andromeda. The photographic plate where Hubble made his discovery is preserved in the Carnegie Observatory's archives, famous for the bright red VAR scrawled on the plate at by Hubble next to the innocuous little point of light that is the Cepheid, clearly illustrating his excitement at what he had found. He knew that, thanks to the Levitt law, this discovery would be able to settle the debate about Andromeda, and indeed about all other spiral nebulae once and for all. Hubble's new Cepheid had a long period of 31 days, meaning it must be quite luminous, but it appeared to be extremely faint. Combined, this suggested that the Cepheid was incredibly far away. Ultimately, Hubble measured the distance to the Andromeda Cepheid of more than one million light-years. At that distance, Andromeda, clearly visible as a spiral in astronomers' observations, must be truly enormous, as large as the Milky Way itself. His result proved that the Andromeda Nebula was not, in fact, a nebula. It was no cluster of stars or gas within our Milky Way. It was instead an entirely separate galaxy located incredibly far away. Hubble had radically altered astronomers' understanding of the scale and nature of the cosmos. He shared his findings with Harlow Shapley in a 1924 letter, prior to their official publication. Upon reading the letter, Harlow Shapley reportedly showed it to fellow Harvard astronomer Cecilia Payne, with the proclamation, Here is the letter that has destroyed my universe. Interestingly, Shapley remained correct on one point. The Andromeda Nova reported in 1885 must have indeed been impossibly bright, given the immense distance that had been measured to the Andromeda. At the time, nobody realised the full implications of this discovery, but in later years, astronomers realised that this event must have not been a nova, but a supernova, the explosive and incredibly luminous death, death of a distant star. This interpretation of the mysterious 1885 event remained speculative for many years. It wasn't until 1988 that astronomers Rob Fenson, Andrew Hamilton and John Sacken discovered the iron-rich remnant left behind by the stellar explosion. Later on, Hamilton and Fezzon captured an image of this supernova remnant with the Hubble Space Telescope. Back in 1924, Edwin Hubble recognised that his incredible discovery had been made possible thanks to the work of Henrietta Leavitt, relating the luminosities and periods of Cepheid stars. He even reportedly argued that Leavitt should receive a Nobel Prize for her discovery. A letter for Levitt arrived at Harvard in 1925 from Gustav Mittag Leffler, a Swedish mathematician and advocate for women in science, informing her that he intended to nominate her for the 1926 Nobel Prize in Physics. Sadly, the letter came too late. Levitt died of cancer in 1921, less than two years before Hubble made his fateful observations of Andromeda. Still, the study of Cepheid variables and the Levitt law identifying them as standard candles continues to this day. Interestingly, the debate over Andromeda's at distance and the nature of Cepheid variables didn't quite end with Hubble. Nearly two decades after Hubble's observation, astronomer Walter Bad, continuing Henrietta Levitt's work, discovered that were actually two classes of Cepheid variables. 
The Cepheids could be split into classical Cepheids, many of the same styles observed by Levitt, and type 2 Cepheids. On the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, classical Cepheids stood out as more massive stars, landing high on the instability strip, while type 2 Cepheids appeared to be lower mass and older stars, lying lower in the instability strip. The distinction between the two classes could be determined by combining the star's spectral types and pulsation periods. Bard's discovery nearly doubled the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, which we now know is about 2.5 million light-years away. This improved understanding of Cepheid variable types also doubled the distance to many other galaxies observed by Hubble, and ultimately doubled Hubble's estimated size of the entire visible universe. But what exactly was Hubble doing, measuring the distances to so many galaxies and estimating the size of the universe? The Andromeda galaxy had, as it turned out, been just the beginning. Hubble's continued work on galaxy distances would go on to directly illustrate the impact of the Levitt Law, beginning the groundbreaking discovery that would be Hubble's most long-lasting and controversial contribution to astronomy.